Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first event in our series, Cooper Faculty Presents. Tonight, we'll hear from mechanical engineering, Professor Kamau Wright. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping rules. Please be sure to keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. Immediately following, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. You can either drop them into the chat or unmute yourself to ask out loud. We are recording tonight's presentation, so if you'd like, feel free to turn your camera off. I'll now introduce Trustee Lou Manzione, chemical engineering grad, class of 1975, who will give a proper introduction to Professor Kamau Wright. Well, thank you, Crystal. Hi, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to the first of the series of presentations by Cooper Union faculty. I want to thank Dean Barry Shoup and the Office of Alumni Affairs and Development for inviting me to provide the introduction tonight. Thanks to Crystal for making all the, all the arrangements. Um, my name is Lou Manzione. Uh, I am an alum of the School of Engineering, 1975. I'm also a member of the Cooper Board of Trustees, uh, and I joined in June of 2021. Um, before I introduce you to Professor Wright, I, I wanted to say a few words of thanks to all of our Cooper Union faculty. Before I say that, I wanted to say that I was sad to hear of the passing of Professor John Bove, who had a profound effect on me and my career with his exceptional wisdom and everything that I read of the testimonials of Cooper alumni that he shared that wisdom with many of us, and many of us have this, the same feeling. Alumni unanimously agree that the Cooper Union faculty were the difference makers in the amazing education that we received. In addition to the effort that they put into teaching, studios, instruction, they're highly accomplished in their own fields with impressive research, prestigious consulting, and distinguished portfolios of creative work. That legacy continues to this day with our faculty in art, engineering, architecture, and the humanities, engaged in extensive research, innovative design, new pedagogies, groundbreaking creative endeavors that all enrich their teaching and bring distinction to our famous institution. Our faculty choose to come to Cooper Square to share their talents, their passion, for scholarship, the, the love of their professions with our unique Cooper Union students. So the entire Cooper community owes a sincere thank you to our faculty for all that they do. I'd like to move on to introduce you to one of our world-changing faculty members and one who was making a real difference in his short time at Cooper Union. Dr. Kamau Wright is assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering. He joined the faculty in July 2021. So just recently, he received his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Howard University and his MS and PhD degrees in Mechanical Engineering from Drexel University. Kamau was visiting professor at the Stevens Institute of Technology nearby in Hoboken and tenure track assistant professor at the University of Hartford, where I met Kamau for the first time. I was the Dean of the College of Engineering, Technology and Architecture at University of Hartford. And I am pleased to have hired and worked closely with Kamau for the years that we overlapped there. How thrilled I was when I heard from Kamau and from Dean Shoup that he was being considered for a faculty position at my alma mater. I had already left the University of Hartford at this time after 13 years as Dean to get back to my children and grandchildren in New Jersey. So at this point, I could be really happy for Kamau and for Cooper Union. I knew immediately that this was a superb badge for Kamau's talent for students. I will leave you with one anecdote of my time together with Dr. Wright at the University of Hartford. I found him to be one of the most student-focused faculty members that we had. He was a superb teacher with some of the highest teacher ratings in the college, but his empathy for students and the importance he placed on enriching student experiences is something truly distinctive about him. When I would see that Kamau was on my calendar for meeting, maybe later that, that afternoon, maybe the next day, I would check on the balance of my discretionary funds. Now, why I did this? 
I was certain that Kamau was bringing me a great idea for students, maybe to send them to an out-of-state conference or to re-energize a student group or to sponsor a student presentation at a nearby meeting. All great experiences for students that I knew that I was going to really like and that I would not be able to turn down whatever the state of my budget might have been. You will not find a faculty member who cares more about students than Professor Wright. Kamau has already built an impressive list of accomplishments at Cooper and has continued with his commitment to students and to learning outcomes. He's innovating with new pedagogies based on inquiry-based learning, building true interdisciplinary teams for his projects, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, electrical engineers on a number of his projects. And it's co-authored a paper for the upcoming ASME meeting with both faculty colleagues and of course, with student co-authors. Dr. Wright conducts work in the fascinating field of plasma engineering. Plasma is this fourth state of matter, not being solid, liquid, or gas, but a highly charged state where the electrons have been stripped from the atoms to create unique properties that are not the same that you could achieve with the conventional three states of matter. Dr. Wright is re researching a number of leading 21st century applications of plasma, and I'm especially to in interested in learning about his work in CO2 decomposition, among a number of other environmental topics that he is exploring. I'm certain that Dr. Wright has already been a tremendous addition to the faculty of Cooper Union. I hope you enjoy his presentation this evening. I know that his students will be beneficiaries of his impact for many years to come. I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Kamau Wright. Kamau, it's all yours. Hello, thank you for that very thoughtful and, and, and detailed introduction. And it's good to hear um, or the reveal of some of the back end and of some of the meetings that we've had in the past. Good evening to everybody here on the call who's joined at this 6.30. Uh, time in the evening, all right? You try to make, make it home or maybe you're still at work tuning in. Uh, happy to have trustees, uh, alumni, uh, faculty, and students and staff on the line. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the use of low temperature plasmas to tackle grand challenges for the next about uh, 30, 30 to 40 minutes. So Please feel free to um, uh, gather questions and, and put them in the chat or hold on to them as, as you see fit. Um, big thank you to Dean Shoup, who will be moderating the talk. Um, in my time here at Cooper Union so far, um, it's been great. Students are super talented. The faculty truthfully care about uh, pedagogical innovation and undergraduate and graduate learning. Um, I feel I've, I've fit in over already really well. Um, in collaboration with my, my colleagues here, and I, I look forward to only taking this even, even higher. Um, so thank you for joining me on this journey and for joining me here tonight. Uh, President Sparks, I, I see you are on. I wasn't sure if you would be on. Uh, honored to be also chosen for as the first speaker for this faculty uh, talks event. All right. Um, I guess I've got going to have to be a trailblazer, but again, thank you. All right, so I'm going to share screen on my uh, presentation now. Uh, all right. So again, my talk is on low temperature uh, plasma systems engineered to tackle grand challenges. And I'm going to start, start off by talking about what some of those grand challenges potentially are and hone in on those that I specifically do research in. Uh, much of my talk will be about plasma decomposition of carbon dioxide. Um, again, thank you um, to Lou for the great uh, introduction. A uh, little bit more about me. Currently, I'm teaching classes like uh, advanced thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, heat transfer experimentation in line with my specialization of plasma engineering and th thermal fluid sciences. Uh, I'm a lifetime member of ASME, a lifetime member of NISPE, and a member of the American Society of Engineering and Education as well. And I've included some pictures, uh, thumb, thumb tiles on the bottom, um, just to kind of illustrate some of the work that I do with plasmas, water, carbon dioxide, thermal fluids in general, 
energy and also with STEM education mixed with the arts. I included a quote here that I really like that I like to share with everybody. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and it's something that I do um, um, live by, which I think encompasses some of the pedagogy, uh, research and service uh, to the university and beyond. All right, so this is a laundry list of grand challenges, so it seems, right? Barely fit on the slide, but these are the 14 grand challenges that were some, uh, um, chosen by the National Academy of Engineers. Um, the list includes advancing personalized learning, making solar energy economical, enhancing virtual reality, reverse engineering the brain, and two that I've highlighted are providing access to clean water and developing carbon sequestration methods. Now, plasmas can directly uh, impact these two grand challenges as well as others. Uh, what we learned from studying low temperature plasmas also crosses over into providing energy from fusion because uh, we're learning about the discharges in general. Um, it also can be used in managing the nitrogen cycle. There's a branch of plasma that is called um, plasma agriculture. Mom, and it can also be used in, hello? Yes, uh, your, your slides are not advancing. It can also be used in, let's see, all right. Do you see a slide that says 14 engineering grand challenges? No, you're on the first slide, low temperature. Okay. How about now? Nope. Not at all, okay. Let me share. Maybe you wanna stop the screen share and then start again. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, Here we go. Is this better? Yes. Now you have the 14 grand challenges, good. <laughs> thank you, thank you for letting me know that. All right, so yeah, so these are our 14 engineering grand challenges. I've highlighted two, uh, providing access to clean water and developing carbon sequestration uh, methods. All right, so a little bit about clean water. So lack of access to clean water is responsible for uh, more deaths than, than war, um, not to be too morbid, but one in six people do not have adequate, adequate access to, to clean water. Of course, the world, the globe has enough water. It's just not always where we need it to be. So Canada typically has um, lots of water for, um, for its constituents, but other places potentially in the Middle East and, and Africa sometimes don't have access to water. So there's engineering challenges in supplying water, right? First of all, most water is in the oceans and that's salty. So we, the salination is gonna be required. Um, the prominent technology that's used is reverse osmosis. Um, the plants can be expensive to build. Uh, it can require a lot of energy to operate. And if you have solids, um, uh, water with very high total dissolved solid content, um, you'll have to swap out these membranes very often. So there are challenges. Uh, potential engineering solutions are to recycle wastewater um, or to generate decentralized distillation units, which I've done some research in. Um, a big issue there would be in softening the water um, so that it can actually be processed in heat transfer uh, systems. So here's a plot from the Mauna Loa Observatory, which um, is used prominently to talk about the increase in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, so this is a set of data points over the course of 60 years, um, showing that we've increased over the past 60 years from 320 parts per million of carbon dioxide to 420 and above uh, from this site. Um, the fluctuation there uh, related to seasonal changes in carbon dioxide and photosynthesis from plants based on the season. Um, but in general, um, this is an increasing curve. This is a about a 30 second plot um, from uh, NASA, which shows, I believe 1890 to the present. So it's a time-lapse image, which shows plus or minus one to two degrees of the temperature, average temperature on the world. Uh, blue is lower than uh, average and red of course is above. Um, right now we're at about 1995 and we see that there is actually a warming of our environment in the globe, and this is 2021. So we're about two degrees higher um, than we were before. All right, so why is carbon dioxide a problem? We've talked about it. In pre-industrial times, we expected to have about 300 
parts per million of carbon dioxide. Today, we're well above 400 parts per million and growing, right? This general evidence for carbon dioxide trapping heat and boosting temperatures. Consequences include rising sea levels, um, storms that are stronger and, and occur more often, and disruptions in agriculture. What is engineering challenge? Well, uh, most of our energy is uh, produced using fossil fuels and hydrocarbons. Uh, carbon sequestration would be capturing this key CO2 and storing it away from the atmosphere or even decomposing and repurposing it. And that's what I, I like to talk about a bit. So how do you capture CO2? Uh, quick ideas that we could use methods from uh, beverage carbonation facilities and dry ice manufacturing. Um, we could burn coal and pure oxygen. Uh, it'll make it easier to separate the carbon dioxide from the exhaust. But still, we have costs in actually uh, separating the initial oxygen that we would use for these processes. So this is a bit of an overview of this issue. So uh, some of the research that I've done it has been supported through uh, uh, groups like NASA, the NASA CT Space Grant, are related to decomposing carbon dioxide uh, for two key reasons. We talked about the terrestrial uh, earthbound uh, uses and needs for decreasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but also to advance human space travel, right? The Martian atmosphere is actually 96% carbon dioxide, and we could actually use this decomposition as a source of oxygen if we have the appropriate uh, technologies with the appropriate uh, efficiency and conversion rates. So I want to talk more about plasma. So as uh, uh, Lou had said, our trustee, uh, fourth state of matter is uh, a term used to describe plasma. Why? Because it's a, a fourth and more energetic state than solids, liquids, and gases. So plasmas, stated most simply, are considered to be ionized gases. What that means is that uh, there's at least one electron which is unbound from the molecule. How we typically form plasmas in the lab is that we apply some electric field. I'll talk about the level of electric field. We're able to energize the electrons first because those are the lighter particles. And those electrons bump into the, the gas to activate the gas. We have excitation, we have ionization, we have dissociation of molecules. So this type of environment consists of very reactive species, right? You have the electrons, you have the ions, you also have radicals, you have excited atoms, and you also have excited molecules in addition to the neutral atoms and molecules that you typically have. Now, the ionization degree can vary with plasmas. With high temperature plasmas, like you'll find in nuclear fusion, um, these are fully ionized, right? So there's an electron that's been knocked out of all of the atoms or all of the molecules that you have there. And the plasmas that uh, we do research in, low temperature plasmas, the ionization, ionization degree is much lower, right? On the order of 10 to the negative fourth or 10 to the negative six. So you don't need to have most of a gas ionized in order to form a plasma. You'll still see a visible plasma. So this reactive environment gives way to interesting applications, uh, interesting chemical reactions, and higher energy efficiency with some process. New products without heating the entire gas, right? So we can have more efficient processes. Now, the term plasma was developed in 1928, right? Stated by Irving Langmuir. Except near the electrodes where there are sheaves containing very few electrons, the ionized gas contains ions and electrons in about equal numbers. So plasmas have ions and electrons in about equal numbers, even though the electrons have been knocked away from the molecules themselves. Examples of plasma, which you may have seen or heard of, are lightning is actually a plasma, right? You have this discharge and breakdown in the atmosphere, uh, similar to a spark discharge, which we, can, which we can generate in the lab. The aurora borealis, which is pictured on the slide, this is a view from Finland, not my own picture, but um, this is a non-thermal plasma. At 100 kilometers, the atmosphere is no longer remains uh, non-conducting due to ionization. Earth's magnetic field interacts with charged particles from the sun. These particles are diverted and often trapped by Earth's magnetic field, right? So we see these interesting lights called the aurora borealis um, or the northern lights. Um, interestingly enough, a few days ago, uh, I said that we might be able to see these northern lights from New York City. Um, it kind of it bypassed us, but there were some places in the United States that you were able to view this um, for those who are interested. So this is a plasma setup that uh, I've developed before and managed some work with um, graduate students that I've had, uh, generating an atmospheric pressure glow discharge 
On the left, you see an actual experimental setup, which has two pin to plane discharges. And the right side is a simulation that we did with uh, ComSol. So it just gives a glimpse of the type of work that we can do. So let me highlight some major features of plasmas. Uh, one, the temperatures. So temperatures at least of at least some of the plasma components and the energy density can exceed those in conventional technologies. So if we wanted to coat a uh, turbine blade with uh, ceramic, we can use plasmas to generate the high temperatures you would need to melt a uh, ceramic. Secondly, plasmas are able to produce very high concentrations of energetic and chemically active species as described before. And thirdly, plasma systems can essentially be far from thermodynamic equilibrium. What that means is, while we might think of plasma as the surface of the sun, I talked about uh, lightning, um, you can think of this energetic process the picture that I have in the type, top right corner is actually someone's thumb in contact with a plasma. See, the electrons have been energized and do have a high electron temperature, we'll call it, but the gas, the bulk mo uh, gas temperature of the molecules is actually near to room temperature, so you're able to actually contact this type of plasmas. The other three pictures here, you do not want to bring your hand in contact with, all right? Um, all right, so I have highlighted different types of plasmas, low pressure plasmas, atmospheric pressure plasmas, high current equilibrium plasmas. Arc welding is a good example. Uh, corona discharges from power lines are an example you might be used to, uh, certain lamps. And plasmas are actually used in the manufacture of ozone. We use dielectric barrier discharges. It also contextualizes a little bit more between these high temperature plasmas and these low temperature plasmas that I'm describing in this presentation. I've shown a, a plot of um, the electron temperature versus the number density. So the discharges we were talking about, not in thermal nuclear fusion, which are far to the right, would be like a glow discharge um, or even potentially a flame. And I have a conversion here for electron volts. For those who don't typically use electron volts, this is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, if you see it referenced in the slides. All right, we have glow discharges, corona discharges, arc discharges, gliding arc and reverse vortex. There are different ways to generate plasma discharges at low pressures and at atmospheric pressure. So what am I talking about? I'm talking a little bit about carbon dioxide splitting. When we split carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide and oxygen, um, this is the enthalpy involved, which I have in units of electron volts. I also show sometimes uh, kilojoules instead, right? This is at 300 Kelvin. So what I want to say is that the thermal splitting of carbon dioxide is favorable at high temperatures. I'm going to explain that through this plot that you see here. Towards the left, you don't see much of a graph, right? This shows that um, we're not going to have decomposition of carbon dioxide and further formation of carbon monoxide and oxygen at lower temperatures, right? We're gonna keep carbon dioxide settled right where it wants to be. So I'll highlight some temperatures in this range uh, that are of interest. From 3000 Kelvin to 3500 Kelvin, it, we see that there's a peak in the energy efficiency that we can obtain. This is based on thermodynamics, right? Above 3,500, we see that we start to have a decrease in the energy efficiency. This is the red line, which I'm traversing right now um, with my cursor, if you can see that. And the black line, the conversion, that actually still does increase. So at 5,000 Kelvin, we can completely convert all the carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide and oxygen. Problem solved, right? The question is, how do we achieve these temperatures? And then also, are these energy efficient processes? So this 3000 Kelvin point is kind of, could be the best point for energy efficiency and also conversion. We're trying to achieve some mixture in the two. Now there are different strategies. If we can separate the carbon monoxide from the oxygen immediately during a reaction, we can actually have higher efficiencies in conversion. I'll give you an example. There's one paper that utilizes uh, membranes, uh, calcium stabilizer conia. And at a temperature of 1954 Kelvin, as they uh, reported it, their conversion was 21.5%. Now, according to this graph and this black line, the conversion thermodynamically should be about one to 2%. So it shows that if we are able to separate the carbon monoxide from the oxygen, um, we can actually achieve higher conversion rates. 
Now, even this study, unfortunately, uh, had some issues with recombination, which is the opposite of ionization. So for plasma, we're ionizing the gas. If we recombine these molecules, we form the carbon dioxide again, and we don't have a net uh, gain in the decomposition of carbon dioxide. So the point I want to make here is this. The design of reactors is key in improving plasma decomposition of carbon dioxide. Whether we can separate the uh, chemicals that we've already treated or even cool and quench them before they have a chance to react. So if we can have very fast quenching and cooling, we can also help these uh, chemicals not to recombine and we can effectively increase our efficiency and conversion of carbon dioxide. This plot here shows the different processes involved in plasma decomposition of carbon dioxide, whether it's dissociation, ionization, the recombination that I described to you. Um, and also these oxygen or the excited oxygen uh, atoms and molecules, if we can actually use those and have them uh, in uh, interactions with the initial CO2, we can also gain uh, more efficiency, right? Because we're increasing the reactions and we're increasing the dis dissociation of carbon dioxide, which is our goal to split the CO2. All right, let's talk more about strategies, uh, what we should be looking at, what we could be aiming for with plasmas, the state of art of plasma technology to decompose carbon dioxide. Now this plot that I'm showing, it looks a bit similar. It's slightly different though. Um, these are calculated theoretical thermal conversions on the left and energy efficiency on the right, um, corresponding to if we have carbon dioxide in the presence of water during these reactions. Now, what you'll notice is the curves have a similar shape at least, right? And we see some peaks still around 3000 Kelvin. All of this to say uh, water present during these reactions is not necessarily gonna result in a more efficient process um, but the reason why we like these reactions is because water is obviously very abundant, uh, cheap, and it makes it so that we can um, potentially have a hydrogen bearing uh, candidate in, uh, next to carbon dioxide. So this has been tried with multiple chemicals. One is methane or CH4, one is hydrogen, and one is, is water, right? So it's easier to convert CO2 when it's paired with one of these, right? But in this case, for the plot that I'm showing with water, we actually don't achieve very high efficiency. People are still um, researching this though, there's, there's still interest. Now there's a lot of conversion approaches um, that I don't go into detail in this presentation, it's outside the scope, but I'll talk about electrochemical conversion, solar thermal chemical conversion, photochemical conversion, biochemical conversion, and catalytic conversion, right? These are all different novel technologies that I use uh, to de decompose uh, carbon dioxide. All right, in this plot, I want to show a little bit about how we actually generate plasmas in the lab, these high electric fields. So I'm going to choose the nitrogen curve, which here is purple, um, but similar curves, to make an explanation of how we actually get a breakdown of a plasma. So of course, we apply a high enough electric field, high enough for what? High enough for the specific gas that we're talking about. So if we were, well, you are in the room that you're in right now, where I assume the pressure is one atmosphere, right? And this is in units of pressure times diameter. I'm going to explain that in a minute, right? So the pressure in the room you're in right now is 760 torr. That's atmospheric pressure. And I'm going to assume I have a gap that's about one centimeter wide, right? Between two electrodes. So if I have a one centimeter gap and 760 torr, I multiply those, the value is 760 torr centimeter or centimeter torr. And that is this bottom axis on this graph. So 760 torr centimeter would be close to the right side of this plot. It's uh, 7.6 times 10 squared, right? So almost a thousand, almost 10, 10 cubed. Now on the other axis, we have uh, the potential difference or the voltage, right? Measured in volts. So if I'm at 760 torr centimeter, and I look at this nitrogen line, and I were to trace this towards the left, the question is, how much voltage or what type of potential difference do I need to form plasma? And the answer you get is on the order of magnitude of 10 to the fourth power, close to three times 10 to the fourth power. So that's 30,000 volts. 
So what this means is if we can apply a breakdown voltage of 30,000 volts per centimeter at atmospheric pressure, we can form a plasma in the room that you're currently in. Now, we're looking at this, glass and, uh, this graph another way, let's say we had a vacuum pressure, maybe a tenth of the value of the pressure in your room right now. So not somewhere you would be, but somewhere where you would place the electrodes, the reactor with all the cooling and everything that we talked about. So that would be uh, between this 10 to the first and 10 to the second power. I'll go back to the curve for nitrogen. I go across and we've decreased the order of magnitude of the breakdown voltage. We're now at an order of magnitude of 10 to the third. So we're talking about maybe 5,000 volts, right? Five to 10,000 volts max, right? So the point here is if we have a lower pressure, it's easy to form a plasma, but obviously it takes energy to depressurize a space. All right, this plot here shows a specific type of plasma discharge, and it's few. This one specifically is a dielectric barrier discharge. What's interesting about dielectric barrier discharges is that it places, well, a dielectric barrier in between the electrodes. In that sense, it almost is like a capacitor. Right? It builds capacitance on one electrode, and then you have this breakdown. Now, why people are interested in DBDs are, for one reason I mentioned uh, early on in, in, in this talk, uh, generation of ozone, right? which we can use to uh, decontaminate or inactivate bacteria and viruses. That's one reason. But also because you actually have a more diffuse discharge between this type of setup. The point here being is that, again, reactor design is a key element of the state of the art of plasma discharge use and decomposing carbon dioxide. We can have more diffuse plasmas. We can have uh, plasmas with higher um, uh, potential differences. We can have uh, more intense cooling. Um, fluid mechanics uh, and heat transfer plays a role in these reactions, for example, with carbon dioxide. And we could actually, again, cool the discharge much quicker with these non-equilibrium discharges, which are not as hot as the sun, right? They're not as hot as, you know, a bolt of lightning. They're cooler, like the one that the thumb was touching. If we have these type of non-equilibrium discharges, then we could potentially have higher efficiency CO2 decomposition, right? So this is the state of the art with this type of discharge. All right, where are plasmas used also? I talked about where they occur naturally, um, but they're also used in material science uh, for coating, deposition, a surface modification. Without plasmas, we wouldn't have uh, the microelectronics industry that we have right now, because um, we're able to etch um, these wafers. Um, we're, we're able to etch with uh, plasma dischargers, right? We're able to manufacture the microchips utilizing plasmas. Plasma also, plasmas are also used as light sources, lasers, and displays. Now, this is a different type of reactor. This one's called a gliding arc discharge. And there's actually uh, two, two different types of setups. On the left side is a two-dimensional classic gliding arc discharge. These are two plates uh, that are arranged vertically. So there's a plasma breakdown between them. And there's actually this buoyancy effect because the plasma channel is heating up, the temperature increases, the buoyancy um, increases, and the plasma wants to glide above, glide vertically, um, away from where it initially has a breakdown. So that's a two-dimensional reactor. Um, since then, we've had these 3D cylindrical reactors. We were able to mimic the same type of regimes with this reactor, but with a spinning or a tangential inlet for gas flow. These are of high interest for uh, uh, CO2 gas decomposition, uh, specifically, specifically because of the, um, the cooling that I described, right? So not only can we have breakdown with the plasma, we can also potentially create jets and stretching of an arc, which makes it so that these uh, plasma columns, the purple uh, areas that you see on the slide, um, are stretched and a little bit more cooler, right? And we understand a little bit why we would want to have a cooler um, plasma, right? High electron temperature, low gas temperature. All right, some uh, results. So prominent uh, factor that's used in these type of studies are specific energy input, which could be reported as electron volts per molecule, it could be kilojoules per molecule as well. Again, I gave a, a conversion early on in the talk, but this shows basically a map without focusing on any one point of uh, what type of efficiency we've had with gliding arc discharges. So we've had efficiencies as high as almost 
70%, right? Dependent on the specific energy input with different types of reactors, right? So we can not only have uh, gliding arc discharges, but there's certain changes we can make. We have two dimensional, we have three dimensional, um, and it has other things that we could change as well. Here's another opportunity, uh, one which I definitely wanna capitalize in, on and um, potentially through some collaboration uh, right here at Cooper. Um, again, the, the reactors I've shown, I've worked with them and, and built them before. Um, there's different reasons for using them, whether it's a DBD, dielectric barrier discharge or gliding arc. Um, but catalysts present an interesting opportunity. And this is a basic reactor design here. We could either have at the top uh, plasma breakdown between two electrodes. This looks similar to a dielectric barrier discharge or we can couple this in series with a catalyst bed, right? Some sort of reactive catalyst that is either activated by the plasma discharge or is just good at uh, helping and speeding along the process of decomposing carbon dioxide. In some cases, coupling the plasma and the catalyst together actually increases the impact. I'm gonna show an example here, right? For these results that we see on the right side from a, a prominent um, study. So, this blue represents um, uh, CO2 decomposition in the presence of uh, CH4, right? So of course, this utilizes the strategy of having carbon dioxide decomposition in the presence of some substance containing hydrogen, right? Which makes this a more thermodynamically favorable process. So that's strategy one taken care of. So we can say, well, what if you have CO2 by itself? What if you have it in the presence of CH4 or H2 or water like we described before? But the interesting thing here is that you have a plasma, you have a thermal catalysis strategy, then you have a plasma plus thermal catalysis strategy, let's say in series. Now, this last set of bars, the blue and green bar that has these black lines on top of them, the reason this one is interesting is because of synergy. Being able to get the sum of the parts is greater than the parts themselves, right? That's what we're showing here. So having plasma catalysis, plasma in the presence of certain catalysts, and that's a whole research field in of itself, we're able to potentially have much higher conversion, whether you're just treating the blue, which is, uh, uh, excuse me, the green, which is just CO2, or with the blue case, when we have CH4, like uh, reforming. So this shows that there are synergistic effects with plasma discharges and select catalysts, right? And this has been uh, published in uh, research and it's an active area of study, something I definitely intend uh, to do here um, while at Cooper, right? Um, so I talked about the synergistic effects, plasma plus the catalyst, could talk about why it works, how it works. We could be enhancing the electric field. Again, I talked about this dielectric barrier. This dielectric layer actually works almost like a capacitor and builds up capacitance in a discharge. Maybe the catalyst itself can do that. Um, the micro discharge formation in the pores of these catalysts could actually increase surface area, which is great for heat transfer. Um, it changes the discharge type, it can augment it. Um, and the pollutant concentration in the plasma can be you know, greater or higher depending on uh, what's happening there. All right, time check, I have about 10 more minutes in the talk just so people are aware of where exactly I am in the presentation. So this is a general type of setup that you would have, a high voltage power supply, appropriate uh, computer and software, hardware, um, some method of analyzing the concentration or relative concentration of carbon dioxide, like a FTIR spectrometer, like we have here at Cooper, multiple, more than one, um, which I've been happy to be able to use in collaboration with um, chemistry and chemical engineering and only wanna increase um, those collaborations more for my chemical engineering faculty in chemistry that I do see on the line. Um, and some uh, reservoir of, of CO2, of course, right? So this is some results that I've obtained before. Um, these are FTIR uh, spectroscopic results. So on the left axis, you have absorbance units, right? Which are not concentration units of carbon dioxide. But uh, for those who have worked with spectroscopy before, we understand that there's a, a relative ratio of the amount of a substance that can be correlated with the absorbance units. What that means is where I have the number six on this axis and the number two, I can say if some peak were to drop from six to two, I've decreased it by a factor of three. So they're relative. So coupled with some sort of calibration, if we can calibrate what it means to have one absorbance units, what type of concentration that, that responds to, we could change this 
this um, a scale of this graph here. But what's most important here is the relative decrease. And what I've highlighted here is a decrease in one of the uh, prominent peaks of carbon dioxide by 30% in just 10 minutes of plasma treatment with a reactor similar to one I show in the bottom right, right? This was funded through work with the NASA CT uh, space grant, right? So we have the capabilities to uh, replicate and improve on these type of studies uh, right here, and I'm excited to do that. Let's look at this plot, which is a bit busier than the other ones I've shown, but this is to show I want to write all data on plasma discharges. Well, it's not all, but it's, it encompasses all the data on plasma discharges. Uh, the type of discharges that have been most effective, most efficient, or had the most highest conversion rate. So if we could live somewhere in this upper right-hand corner, right, we would have, you know, uh, uh, we would have a system that is, is unstoppable. But we see that there's a trade-off between uh, energy efficiency and conversion. And there's some discharges here that lie somewhere in the middle, such as GA, which stands for a gliding arc discharge, which is, are able to uh, obtain some balance and energy efficiency and conversion. So how do we push it further? We talked about decomposing carbon dioxide in the presence of hydrogen containing uh, molecules. We talked about uh, fluid mechanics and heat transfer, the, the nature of cooling inside of a reactor for quenching. Um, we talked about the use of catalysts, right? So this is not only multidisciplinary work in that we have contributions from different fields, but this is the definite or a definition or of an example of interdisciplinary work. If you are a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, chemical engineer working in this field, uh, what you're doing with this actual high voltage breakdown is only justified by the chemical decomposition. We need to know something about the chemical changes in the system and the uh, components in order to justify why we're making any changes to the electrical system. And same for the mechanical system with the setup of cooling and the presence of different types of materials and electro materials and things like that. They all go hand in hand. So point I wanna make there is that this is interdisciplinary research um, in addition to being just multi, just having multiple disciplines. They, we're, we're dependent on one another. All right, I'll summarize some advantages in this six minutes I have left. So one, we can operate plasmas at room temperature, not the temperature of the surface of the, of the sun, but similar to the schematic, the picture I saw with the finger in contact with a the plasma. There's also flexibility. And I wanna talk about that. We like to be able to press a button and turn something on and it works. We can actually use electrical power to run plasmas, which means we can turn it on to actuate the system. There's also a low cost and low investment because we have to uh, support the power supplies themselves, but you can uh, deploy these type of systems almost anywhere, right? If you have the type of setup uh, and schematic that I've shown during this uh, presentation. So there's a simple scalability, although that is the area of research as well, but if we increase the number of uh, setups that we have, we can increase the um, decomposition rates of carbon dioxide or wh whatever we're trying to treat. Um, if I focus this talk on water treatment, it would be potentially oxidizing organic matter in water or inactivating vac bacteria, uh, which is a huge part of the research I'm doing as well. I want to focus on CO2 here. Also, some studies say it doesn't rely on rare earth metals, which um, if you're familiar is becoming you know, more and more of, a, of an issue, um, even, even geopolitically and as far as uh, resources that we have. Let's talk challenges and opportunities. Well, if it runs on electricity, we can't have the power supply running off of electricity generated with coal. That would totally crush what we're doing by decomposing carbon dioxide. So ideally, we want to have some uh, 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 solar powered or wind powered or alternative energy powered uh, power supplies, which they have, you know, it's not hard to, to, to scale up. But in, in general, the solar to, fuse, to fuel conversion efficiency um, will be a little bit lower. Now, here's why that's a problem, and here's why it could be an opportunity. What we're saying is, with all these alternative energy approaches, if we're able to generate, let's say, solar energy when the sun is out, how do we store it? Energy storage is a huge process. You know, We don't have that many batteries to store it. What if you could take that energy, the sunlight, which was used to a photovoltaic cell uh, to turn it into electricity, what if you can take it and then store the energy as an actual chemical? 
this is a hot area of research with plasma decomposition of carbon dioxide. Can you basically store energy in these chemical compositions from an electrical grid? And the cool thing about it, like we said, it's flexible, it can be actuated very easily, is that it doesn't matter if there's sunlight or not, um, we would be able to convert and store as a chemical, which is honestly the most dense way of storing energy, right? Batteries can't beat the storage capacity of actual chemicals like um, hydrocarbons and things like that. Now, post-processing is obviously needed. I talked about you know, what happens to the carbon monoxide, what happens to the oxygen. We need to actually separate these. So that is um, a huge area of research. All right, I have three minutes left and I would be remiss in my talk if I didn't talk about how here at Cooper Union, we are capable of conducting and building capacity to conduct many of the studies that you see here. And I, I wanna shine some light on uh, some of the activity of uh, student researchers that I have in my lab. And I'll do it through pictures because people like seeing these pictures. I'll show a bunch first and highlight a few of them. I also wanna say, all right, first thing, this is interdisciplinary research. The people that you see in these pictures, the students that you see are not only mechanical engineers. There are electrical engineering students in my lab. There are chemical engineering students in my lab. They are working together. So to me, these pictures are very powerful in that it shows a diversity in backgrounds and disciplines of students that are able to work in the lab on plasma research. This one is actually not in the plasma lab. I wanna uh, highlight the ACE lab here, um, which is uh, as straightforward to use as advertised. This is me with um, some of the um, people that work in the ACE lab. Um, and I brought some students over. This is a water jet cutter. Um, we're able to cut electrodes through very thick sheets of um, metal, like aluminum or, or even stainless steel. Um, so I have some, some of the students that work with me um, also uh, in the ACE lab and, and that's me there um, making sure that the pieces are clean and not overheated and things like that. All right, so uh, again, we have electrical, chemical and mechanical engineers here um, swapping in and out electrodes together uh, regardless of background and we're testing these plate to plate discharges, pin to plane discharges, dielectric barrier discharges, uh, making sure that we have the appropriate safety in the lab. This is the capacity that we're building here. Things that we're looking for, things I didn't get to talk about were like nanosecond pulses are another area coupled with catalysts and mixture of chemicals that are, can help us get higher efficiency with carbon dioxide decomposition. We are, we're building that capacity as we speak. And this is the plasma lab uh, as you see it here. Uh, me with a high voltage glove. There's a discharge between these, the corner of these plates. Um, it's a classic gliding arc Jacob ladder. Which you don't see quite clear here, um, some of the power supplies that we're using and some of the research is here. So with that said, it is 720 on the dot as of right this second. And I just wanna say thank you for your attention um, and interest in, uh, in the talk. Again, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here and happy to take any questions you may have. Great, Kamal, thanks for, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Absolutely amazing. Uh, so um, I'm Barry Shoup. I'm the Dean of Engineering. I have the, uh, the pleasure to moderate the Q&A session. Um, before we start the Q&A, Lou, I'll just go back to some of the comments that you made earlier about uh, Kamal liberating your discretionary funds. His, his latest uh, visit to my office was on Friday, so he, uh, he hasn't changed. <laughs> So if, uh, if anybody has a question, we, we have some questions that were in the chat that were early on. Uh, some of those questions in the chat early on, I think were probably answered. So there were some questions about what the voltage levels were um, in, the, in the setup. So if anybody has a question, uh, please raise your hand, come online. You wanna stop sharing? Oh, sure. Uh, sure. Daniel, you have a question. Yes. Am I only allowed one at a time? Um, let's start with one. Sure. Um, first of all, before the question, Professor Wright, that was excellent. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. Um, I had a question about your pin to plane test system. You showed to a picture of it twice. Um, your pins appear to have like a threaded body. And I'm curious if there was a specific reason for that. Honestly, it wasn't a specific reason that we studied. 
but uh, where we were headed with scaling up the system was specifically about fluid flow and enhanced cooling. So I didn't get a chance to, to study that just yet, but um, uh, in the future, it, it could be of interest. Got it. Sure. Thanks for the question, Daniel. Are you able to measure the gas phase concentration of your reactants and in your products from your reactor? Uh, yeah, we're able to, uh, you know, carbon monoxide with the approach that I use FTIR spectrometry, we're not able to measure for diatomic molecules like oxygen. Um, but there are obviously other ways that we could, could assess. So um, maybe, maybe with a simple GC, you could get some of these, you know, oxygen, CO, CO2. Mm -hmm. and, and if you could study the surface of the catalyst, that would be very interesting. That's always very difficult. But if you could you know, and maybe at least the fresh catalyst and the used catalyst, if you could get some maybe SEM, EDX, or, you know, that would be very interesting. Agree, Evan, you are speaking my language, and I, I hope that the chemistry department, who uh, Andrea Dumark and Agbenai or Korapur <laughs> are on here, I've had, we're having conversations, and we do have a GC um, in the chemistry lab, right. and I've uh, been happy to have been able uh, to be granted access and, and to potentially scale up. So Evan, thank you so much for the question. And, and what kind of residence time does the gas have in your in your reactor? Is it a fraction of a second? It's, it's a fast, uh, a short residence time, short contact time? Another great question. So obviously the flow tests are the one that are gonna be of most interest. Sometimes, and for the results that I showed, I actually uh, conducted experiments with a batch test for that exact reason because I wanted to see the impact of having a very long residence time, at least for the gas inside the um, uh, gas cells. Um, that doesn't actually correlate with the specific residence time for the plasma in contact with the gas, but at least we know we're, we're getting a concentrated effect in, and then we could potentially scale up, so. And have you thought about other products? You, you showed the reaction CO2 going to carbon monoxide and oxygen but you know, you did mention coking of the catalyst. Could you be making a carbon product? Could you be making carbonate? And then in the presence of methane, could you be making interesting molecules, methanol or formaldehyde or some other interesting products? Great points. Um, we could be something that we haven't assessed, um, trying to keep it you know, fundamental um, so we can really um, uh, get at the root of carbon dioxide decomposition. But the, you, you've named some really good things. I'm gonna add one nanoparticles, okay. nanopart the production of nanoparticles, because there's some slight, you know, what might be considered as um, er erosion of the electrodes, but you can actually use it to, to generate nanoparticles, which could potentially be reactive with, with the catalyst. So it, this, this keeps me busy. It, um, is your electrode inert or is, is it catalytically active? It's a good question. Um, it's not inert, but it's not catalytically active. I mean, you can always do yeah. the first test you normally do is we call it a blank reactor study where you run the reaction without the catalyst, without the voltage. Do you get any conversion? You yeah, know, that's that a good would question. give you a clue. You know, is there some sort of catalytic activity from the reactor walls or your electrode or? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Again, I mentioned that as something I want to want to grow into with the, the cata catalyst here. I like your enthusiasm and, you know, you, I can envision dozens of master's theses on, on this or summer projects. Go get it. Absolutely. I like it. Evan, Absolutely. please feel free to reach out if you have more questions. All right. I can send you it. some information because I've been thinking about carbon dioxide in the back of my head for, for a long time. Please do. All right. Thank you. Sure. So we, uh, we have a question uh, from our president. Would you like to ask the question? No. <laughs> It's not me, it's another Laura, although oh, I would I'm love sorry. to take credit for the question. <laughs> Sounds like a good one. Always nice to get a question from President Fox. No, this, this is a different Laura, apparently. So the question is, wouldn't converting CO2 into CO heat the earth more because CO is more potent greenhouse than the CO2? That's a good point, too. Um, how we use the CO, um, which I didn't mention, we want to form value-added chemicals. So uh, CO would not, we would not just release CO into the atmosphere. Again, kind of as Evan had, had touched on it, there's, there's some other aspects to this research that we really need to follow up on. 
which would be a research project in of itself. And I haven't actually, I can't sit here and say that I've, I've uh, done that, but you're right. If we were just generating CO and, and just letting it into the environment, it, it would be- um, it would, And it carbon would, it would monoxide is an interesting intermediate chemical. You know, yes, it's very toxic. You don't want to deal with carbon monoxide by itself. Yeah. But with catalysts, you can convert carbon monoxide to all sorts of useful chemicals through the Fischer-Tropsch process, carbon monoxide and hydrogen and a catalyst, you can go all the way to synthetic gasoline. So carbon monoxide is always a, a very interesting intermediate chemical. Yeah. And you can burn the carbon monoxide like a fuel also. True, that is true. Okay, other questions? Daniel, you said you had a, another question. I think I'll circle back to you and let you ask your second question. Sure, thanks. Um, I wanted to clarify something um, in the um, bar graphs that you showed, there was um, the synergistic effect, which differentiated um, plasma plus thermal catalysis from plasma catalysis. And maybe you explained the difference, but could you just go over that again? I, I couldn't quite catch the difference. Uh, sure. The way I explained it was in having the processes separate in series. For oh, example. okay. Sequential instead of built into one. Exactly. Okay. So it, it directly related to the um, schematic, but that was kind of interesting to see, right? Yes. It's such a absolutely. huge. It's a huge difference. Jump, yeah, which gives us some, you know, again, opportunities and, and for research. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Any other questions for Kamal? Don't be shy. There's the last, oh, president. I the last one, Barry. So I was, I was curious, you know, what the most surprising aspect of the research work with students has been, and you know, I'm, I'm curious about these things that you're pitching to Dean Shoup, um, and, and <laughs> particularly curious about, you know, you bring a fresh perspective to Cooper. What are the things that you think could unlock more opportunities for student research? Sure. Well, the first thing I want to say is I, I deem undergraduate research to be transformative, right? I, I think I attribute that to a lot of my uh, journey in life, uh, or success, uh, if, you, if you call it that, um, undergraduate research. Um, not only does it uh, unlock um, uh, an approach to learning, uh, thank you uh, again, Lou, for introducing me, uh, uh, talking about um, inquiry-based learning, which asks the why, you know, why is this the answer? There's no uh, textbook, there's no answer in the back. Uh, you have to search, you have to do research. So I think the experience in general, uh, pedagogic pedagogically has a great impact and just for lifelong learning has a great impact. Um, and I'm not remiss in my efforts in realizing that while I'm working with students, that you know today is you know cutting in the ACE lab or running FTIR samples or you know some uh, some electrodes get burnt out, but the culmination of of all of that is it turns out to be just a, a I think a dynamic experience for most whether they continue with research graduate study, um, PhDs or even internships and and postgraduate um, employment opportunities. So I think. I think uh, another thing I want to say, people are the root of success. And in and, and some of my description, I know I talk about, you know, learning and engineering and things like that. But, you know, the people of any organization are the reason for the success. And our students here are super talented, amazing. I mean, I could talk about them individually. I'll try to talk about it in general. But um, the fact they're able to get in the lab and, and, and relate this to research and, you know, state of our research that's happening. I think it's just a transformative experience. I'm not sure if I even answered both, all three of your questions though, <laughs> um, but please let me know. Thank you, no, it's helpful. I'm, I'm always curious about what kinds of things could, you know, could unlock more opportunities for our students. Yeah, yeah definitely. Funded undergraduate research opportunities for students, um, for students of various backgrounds. I think it's also helpful for underrepresented minorities as well. Um, as the term that we currently, you know, use, whether it's, you know, men in engineering, women in engineering, uh, black students in engineering, this is something I think that just cuts across, you know, so many different backgrounds and means, means a lot. So I would say undergraduate research, funded undergraduate research is, is, is great. Um, summertime undergraduate funded research, those are things that are, are really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. 
So we are quickly, we're, we're at the end of our hour of this, uh, this first in series. I wanna personally thank everybody for coming, Kamal. Absolutely great talk. I expected, I expected no less uh, with all the energy and everything else. So uh, you have his contact information if you want to reach out to him directly and, and engage some more with him about some more details of the research. But uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. This was a great, uh, great opportunity. And thank you. Thank you, Dean Shoup. Thank you, Lou. And thank you, President Sparks and everybody else on the line. Evan, I hope I hear from you. You had a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear from me, thank you. And anybody who didn't ask a question, I hope I hear from you too. Feel free to reach out. Awesome. Right. Have a great thank evening, you. everybody. Thanks. Thank you.